define the progression of withdrawal, differentiate between different assessment scales, and list some drugs or talk about some that ways to avoid alcohol withdrawal seizures by prophylactically treating people, and identify other treatment um, options if you're having trouble controlling people's withdrawal. So there's 8 million alcoholics in the U.S., which is probably more than our share in Butte, Montana. It's just been a heavy drinking city. And maybe I'm wrong about that, but I've heard that from other physicians that they've worked other places and they've never seen alcohol problems like they do here. Maybe it's, um, I don't know, maybe that's my imagination, but I suspect we, if you looked at the data, it probably did have a high prevalence more than some cities. Anyway, there's more than 500,000 episodes a year in the U.S. It's interesting, too, because the other physicians I talk to, they'll say, how no, they don't admit people with alcohol withdrawal. I think, how do you not admit people with alcohol withdrawal? I don't know how that works. Because some of these people are, I can't walk, they're vomiting, they're, you just couldn't, I can't even imagine seeing them home. Maybe they don't count that if they're really sick. But. So obviously the male predominance is 5 to 1, maybe that's rude for me to say, but at least if you look at the alcoholics that we have in the hospital, the majority of them are men. We do have quite a few alcoholic women as well that keep coming back. But in general, it's men. A lot of them know each other, have you noticed that? <laughs> they live together and spread lice, et cetera. So um, anyway, not to have a hip violation, but everyone probably knows who I'm talking about if they've been on the floors lately. So um, alcohol withdrawal ingredients. I mean, you obviously have to be dependent on alcohol to get withdrawal. And you have to be withdrawn or abstaining from alcohol, either voluntarily, like you decide, oh, I've got to quit drinking, or my wife's going to leave me, or my husband's going to leave me, or my kids are going to be taken away. Or you might be admitted for surgery, acute appendicitis. So you're enforced by injury. Or you might be arrested and sent over to the jail. So. Oh, I turned it off. Oh, okay, thank you. I went to the bathroom. Sorry for the interruption. No, it's okay. <laughs> That's better than that. You can hear me better. So, you know, obviously, the diagnosis is fairly easy for withdrawal in general. Uh, sometimes, though, we miss it because you don't think about the 80 year old little lady. Nobody knows drinks until she comes in with a broken hip. And all of a sudden, she starts getting agitated and nervous and confused, hallucinating. Um, but, you know, when you look at lab tests, that'll give you a clue if their ASD and AMT are up. Um, obviously, if they have cirrhosis, their platelets might be low, their INR might be prolonged. You might see stigmata of liver disease, like I should have taken some pictures and shown you some, but, you know, the, um, the little spider angiomas that alcoholics have, especially those with liver disease, those are a classic. You can get them from sun damage and other things, but if you see a lot of them, you worry. And if you see evidence of trauma, like they've been in fights or they've been falling because they're getting drunk all the time, that could be a red hair that maybe they're an alcoholic and nobody knows it. Or alcohol affects everything in your brain and your GI tract, everything in your body. It is a, a be all drug. <laughs> it's one of those legal drugs um, that uh, affects your whole body. It, one of the biggest things I see, and one of the reasons some of these alcoholics get so sick is they're so nutritionally challenged that I think it makes it harder for them to recuperate. A lot of alcoholics you talk to, they eat every third day, every other day, they're just never hungry. Have you guys noticed that? They never eat. Once they get sober, they usually have an appetite, maybe, but it's a, a serious problem. Luckily, I've never had that happen to me. Not like <laughs> it does happen to them. And so obviously the differential, I mean, it might be that they come in and they look alcoholic, they look drunk, but maybe they're hypoglycemic because um, someone changed their medicine or they got the wrong prescription. So you always have to think about other things. Or maybe they look drunk or they have a subdural or an intracranial hemorrhage. So you always have to think about other things that could be making someone look like a drunk. And you could have been dr a drunk for many, many years and then come in with sepsis. You know, so you always have to keep your eyes open for new things in the same patient. Because all of us, especially like hospitalists, you get, oh, it's the same patient. And I'm sure like the shade floor nurses, I've seen this patient six times with the same thing. But today it might be E. coli sepsis instead of. So you always have to keep that in mind. This is the CAGE questionnaire. It's just a questionnaire that you, I don't, you guys don't have to do this in your assessment, do you? Nurses? No. But 
it's, you know, it's a physician questionnaire normally, but nurses can use it too. It basically is um, a four questionnaire that predicts fairly well whether people have alcohol problems. Have you ever felt like you should cut down? That's the C for cage. Have um, people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking? That's the A, so cut down, annoyed. Guilty, have you ever felt bad or guilty about your drinking? And some people have no remorse, but <laughs> so a lot of alcoholics will feel guilty. Um, have you ever had a first thing um, drink, an eye opener? So that's the E, so um, cut down, annoyed, guilty, an eye opener. So if they answer four, <laughs> To all four, they had 101 percent. I don't know how they got that percentage, but um, you know, obviously the percentage goes up by accuracy and diagnostic value if they answer yes to all those. And some people just get agitated or feel guilty about other reasons, and it's not alcohol related. And the other question I frequently will ask patients is, "Have you had a DUI?" And you do see some alcoholics that have never had a DUI, and you see some people that have had three DUIs and swear up and down they're not an alcoholic, but. It's another marker for alcohol problems, and so I frequently ask that. Sometimes people get pissed off at me, but I think it's important to know. I mean, it just helps you with their social. Now, it might have been that their three DUIs were when they were 15 to 29 and they quit drinking, but then usually they'll tell you, yeah, I had three DUIs, but not for 30 years. So then you can say, okay, they're probably gonna be all right. So some of the symptoms, which we see all the time in the ER, on the floor, anxiety, nervousness, can't sleep, nauseated, headache. Um, when you go in and assess them, the signs would be agitation, tremor, tachycardia, low-grade fever, and even high-grade fever if they're having more withdrawal. Um, stage one is when they get the hallucin I mean, the tremulousness. Stage two, hallucinations. Stage three, using seizures. And stage four is the most deadly one, the one we want to avoid, the true DTs. So it's interesting, that was one thing I didn't realize. I was thinking all those stages were DTs, but it's saying really only the end stage is DTs, you know, the ones that are here for six, seven days, because they get really crazy and agitated. Um, so symptom delay, the DTs usually happen three to five days. Seizures usually within the first six to 48 hours. It's usually two days after. Um, hallucinations within the first day and then tremulousness can happen within 6 to 36 hours. I mean, you do see alcoholics that truly can go 24 hours without drinking, but they really are an alcoholic. And I tend to say people are alcoholics even if you just use alcohol emotionally. You know, the patient that will tell you, yeah, I can't relax until I've had my beers. You know, you say, oh, you're an alcoholic. They don't like to hear that. They're probably not physically addicted yet, but they're mentally addicted, and I think it's a bad sign when you start having to have a drink. So next time you feel like you have to have a beer, maybe think maybe I should go for a run or something or a walk or read a good book, go get a massage or something, do something a little bit different because you have to worry that you're starting to become dependent on alcohol. Um, the tremulousness, like I said, it usually happens pretty quick. Um, it's, it's caused by autonomic hyperactivity. And some people have a tremor anyway, so it can be complex. The other thing that's interesting is Essential tremors or benign essential tremors will get better with alcohol, so people that genetically develop that as they age. And those patients will tend to drink to control their tremor because the alcohol will reduce their own tremor. Often those patients will become alcoholics, though, because it's, it's a catch-22. Have you seen anyone like that? I've seen quite a few patients that quote, I only started drinking for my tremor. And I, I do sometimes believe that and then it's easy just to continue drinking. The other one that was funny that I heard in my office one time from an alcoholic is, well, I was traveling to Mexico and my doctor told me to drink tonic water. And then I started drinking gin and tonics and if that doctor's fault that I'm an alcoholic, I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't think your doctor told you to drink gin and tonics, but I can understand that the tonic water tasted bad without the tonic gin, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, so the stage two hallucinations, we've all seen these, the pink elephants, the pink dolphins, the weird crawling bugs on the wall. It's a sign to be concerned. And you can have auditory and visual hallucinations just from an acute delirium, from sepsis, or from um, just your hip fracture and hypotension and just clinically being ill. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're an alcoholic. People are developing those 
The stage three, which is this, the rum fits, this is one that when I was reading through the literature, it was talking about prophylactically treating patients that have had a high risk of seizures by giving them anti-seizure medication at the front end of their alcohol withdrawal to keep them from having a seizure. I thought that was really interesting because I didn't learn that in my training. Did you guys learn that in your pharmacy training? No. I didn't either. So. I think some of the studies are more recent and I just didn't read all the studies that came out in the last five years. Can you believe that? I do try to keep up and it's, it's easy when you're looking through and you're saying, wow, wow, got to read, got to keep up. Anyway, um, so seizures, uh, the biggest risk is alcohol abuse. 40% are single, but um, if they're untreated, they'll go on to DTs. The other thing that I want you to all keep in your back of your mind during this talk is we had two, this one patient that um, Dr. Reiser in the surgery section asked me to think about. He came to the ER. He was intoxicated. The police brought him. He um, went to the jail because they didn't see any indication for admission, right? He wasn't vomiting, he wasn't hypokalemic, he didn't want to stop drinking. He was just drunk. So they sent him to the, to the jail, and he had a seizure and came in with a um, uh, hematoma. So they asked me, could we have avoided that by admitting him? So I don't know. I mean, those are always interesting. Do you admit these people just because now, if we saw him again and he told us that I've had a seizure, would we admit him just to keep him for a little bit? Maybe, but you can think about that. I'm still not sure we could have helped that guy. And then he came back again. I think he got arrested again and had another seizure, another bleed. <laughs> like this poor guy. He obviously is malnourished, doesn't eat, and that um, enhances his, his health risk. So anyway, the run fits we want to avoid people having seizures. So this just talks about how much alcohol puts you at risk for withdrawal or alcoholism or seizures, per se. So one beer is 10 grams. I'm not sure how much a glass of wine or gin and tonic would be, but I think it's about the same. And um, so obviously, the more drinks, five to 10 drinks a day is more likely. It gives you a threefold increase and increases the more you drink. But that's the other thing that's interesting. I'm sure you guys all know when people tell you I drink two drinks they probably drink four. If they tell you they drink five, you know, they probably drink. Or I love it. Oh, I don't drink. I just, I uh, just, you know, just on Saturday. Well, how many do you have? Okay, so, you know, or something. You're like, what? <laughs> it's much more dangerous to drink 12 drinks all at once than it is to drink two drinks every day. You know, but people don't think, it, think of it as that way. They think of alcoholics drink every day, so it's safer if I just go get wasted once a week and I abstain the rest of the week. It's true they probably won't develop physical dependence if they're only getting wasted once a week. But you're at risk for DUI, you're at risk for liver problems, blood problems. I mean, if you draw blood on those people, you see their, their red cells start to expand. The, you know, the MCV is up on those on patients that are alcoholic. Have you ever noticed that? And partially it's because the alcohol damages your red cells. You also get an acute alcoholic hepatitis. So most of those patients, if you were to draw blood the next day after they got drunk at a party, even though they're not an alcoholic, you would see acute alcoholic hepatitis. Even a well-nourished person like me, if I were to go and get really wasted, probably the next day you'd see lab abnormalities. The good news is the liver heals extremely well, and so most of the time it feels fine, but it's not a good thing for your health. But I don't mean to diverge, I'm sorry. So anyway, DTs usually come up three to five days, and that's the thing that we want to avoid. Um, the risk factors is if they're sick with uh, pneumonia or sepsis or E. coli or they have pancreatitis, if it's been a few days, if they've had a history of a seizure, and if they're older, age, age greater than 60. So obviously what we want to do is we want to make these patients feel better, prevent seizures, prevent DTs, and prevent medical complications. The other thing that I find a challenge taking care of patients that are alcoholics is it seems like we've seen them over and over and over again. I find it very frustrating. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to be compassionate when you they seem so self-destructive, but try this and try. <laughs> it's, it's not always easy, is it? <laughs> it's like, sometimes it's really hard, but a lot of these patients are doing the best they can. They just are having all kinds of physical problems that they're having trouble making changes in their lives. But so the quiet environment helps, especially if they're in DTs, they need a high fluid rate. If you look at our DT protocol in the past, it's had like 200 an hour. I think I dropped it down to 150. 
and um, make sure you get the potassium, magnesium better. Benzodiazepines are going to be the cornerstone of treatment, obviously. Um, and I love the patient who has an allergy to Ativan because grandma came in and she got Ativan. Well, it's because she's an alcoholic. <laughs> the Ativan didn't make her confused. She was confused because she was having DTs. But, you know, those patients, they say, well, I'm allergic to Ativan. I'm allergic to Haldol. That's like the ones that say they're allergic to morphine. No, wait, Toradol. What do they say they're allergic to? Toradol, Darvacet, right? So they cut morphine and other narcotics. Yeah, they're allergic to NSAIDs. They're allergic to anything unless it's morphine or dilatic. Anyway, so benzos are the cornerstone of treatment. Um, this is something that I learned that it was a new study in 2007, and it's been my instinct to just treat them symptomatically, but basically what the new, the, the, the study that I read is um, that if they're, and we can get into it in a minute, but the, the, what you want to do is generally do symptom triggered treatment unless they're super high risk for DTs and those patients you want to front load with a fixed dose. Um, so I have got some more slides on it, but basically benzodiazepines they reduce the psychomotor agitation as soon as you give it to them, they calm down. Although, I'm amazed how many people in the ER have a 0.35 and they're begging for Ativan. And they already have a tremor. Have you seen those patients or is it just me? And maybe it's the ER. If you don't work the ER, you don't see those patients. But I don't know, maybe those people ride 0.45 all the time and 0.3 feels bad for them. But it's interesting. You can have withdrawal even if you're still drunk. Um, but I tend to be want to hold, hold the Ativan until, maybe I shouldn't be holding it. That's a, one thing I was reading this saying, you know, maybe I should be more compassionate and if they really are having signs of DTs, even if they're drunk, maybe they do need it. It is sometimes hard because you wonder, are they making this up? You can't make the fever up, you can't make some of the physical autonomic hyperactivity up. Certainly if their heart rate's 60 and their blood pressure's 100 and they're telling you they're tremoring, you know, what happened with withdrawal, they probably aren't. I think. You know, but if their heart rate's 120 and their blood pressure is 150 and they look sweaty and agitated, they probably are, even if they do have an alcohol level of 0.25. So Valium, Valium and Librium and Advent are the most common. Here we use Cerex as well. Um, and um, Valium is nice because it has a very long half-life. Um, so treatment of these of patients with DTs <coughs> or withdrawal, a big schedule is what we've been doing at St. James per our protocol for the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. Although, you know, I find that some of the nurses hold the benzos if they don't think they need them. Don't you guys hold them sometimes even though you're supposed to give them? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and sometimes they just look so good, it doesn't make sense, I think, sometimes. So the, the change in the order is one thing is to make a PRN so that you can assess them, use the CWA score to help you. and. Um, the symptom trigger therapy, which is what I was going to propose that we use, goes on this um, Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment um, Guide, which I think you told me we are using, basically. Centricity doesn't have it perfectly in there, but that's what the nurses are using. Um, the advantage is, you know, you get fewer benzos and you do a shorter course on these patients than if you continue to give it all the time. Um, Obviously, a disadvantage is that you could have someone end up in DTs or have a seizure because you missed the autonomic cover activity. Or, like I said, it's hard to continue your compassion and focus on that patient when they seem to be making things up and then the next thing you know they aren't making it up. You know, that's the hard part too. It's, it, it is hard. Um, so basically, it's a 10 item system. And you guys know it. I shouldn't even be describing it to you. It, it was just new to me. And it describes the withdrawal severity. It correlates with with severity. It it's helpful to talk, and maybe the doctors do need to know so you can tell me. It has a, they have a CWA score of ten, and I'll know what you're talking about. Because if you told me that today, I wouldn't probably still know what you were talking about. Although I've recently read about it, but maybe it's something we should be telling each other. But obviously, if they have a very high CWA score, you should be calling the doctor and call and saying, "Look, I can't get this patient under control, and they're very." they're still having very severe withdrawal. Um, so it enhances um, communication. So the caveats, it's not diagnostic of withdrawal because you can have a high CWA score for other reasons. It's only an assessment tool and you have to interpret it in a clinical context, obviously. So um, 
you can't just treat a number like everything in medicine. So these are the 10 things, the orientation, headache, auditory and visual disturbances, tactile disturbances, sweating, agitation, tremor. The modified Ramsey scale is the scale that we use for intubated patients or patients that are unable to, to communicate. And um, I think we do use that here, don't we? Not uh, what are the ICU nurses using for intubated patients? They're using the CWAP from what okay. I understood. Now, I'm not in the ICU, but okay. I did ask them, they're using the CWAP scale. Okay. So they're not differentiating between the patient who put on the tube or anything like that. They're just using the CWAP for patients who can communicate back to them. Right. And if you can get communication with the patient, you should use the CWAP scale. This is designed for patients that can't talk. And so, or can't communicate. Right. So it's a very simple scale, and we probably should be using it for those intubated patients. So, and I think it'll come on Epic because I got these order sets right off some Epic systems in Seattle. So they're kind of handwritten, but they'll be on Epic and they'll be easy to use. I think hopefully. And this is just another agitation scale that you can use in the ICU as well. Basically, just um, <clears throat> on how to decide whether they need treatment with benzos. I mean, our nurses in the ICU are extremely skilled in knowing whether they should turn up the Versed or not. So many of those patients are on the Versed drip, so they're already doing it. It's just instinctual rather than written down and scaled. That's the interesting part about taking care of patients. A lot of it is instinctual and it's not necessarily something, but it is nice if you use a system so that you can talk to each other and not just this my gut instinct versus you know your assessment. Um, so here's some fixed dose regimens. I think the one that I ended up choosing was the Librium or the Chlorodiapoxide. It should be cheap, right? And I've heard that we have it in our pharmacy. Librium, I haven't used for a while, but a couple of the doctors that have come and worked for me have told me that they've used it in other hospitals and it's worked really great. And so, <clears throat> although it's not ID, is it? Well, so, I think it comes ID. We don't have any other fuel. Yeah, well, and, I, and my instinct is for now, I have to look at how I did the orders for that. But I think if they if they can't if they need ID we can go to Ativan, which makes sense. So I think I wrote for both. Um, so the, the advantage of Librium is it's um, intermediate onset. It um, it has a potential accumulation though for people with severe liver disease, and all benzos have a, 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 po a possible of accumulation, even Versed in somebody with severe liver disease, and elderly. So it really shouldn't be given for those patients. But Valium and Ativan can both be easily given IV, and so I think if you have someone who's vomiting, then you should probably be given Ativan. I think that you guys think it's a lot better, because you don't want to have to be switching back and forth. The um, diazepam, I think, has more uh, higher buildup because of its low Diazepam, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. It can be great for some patients, but it's not necessarily as versatile as Ativan and probably the Librium. So I think it was the Ativan and the Librium that I chose. Um, so Ativan, you can get breakthrough seizures because it, it, does, it has a shorter half-life. Um, so what I was proposing is that we go to the PRN dose with a fixed schedule only for the high-risk patient. And I don't think I made a slide of that order set, so. No, and it, it's on the communicator now just so everybody knows, and the memo's gonna go out so, so that you can preview it and give us your feedback, too. Yeah. The nice thing too that I, I it's nice too to sometimes just try it on the first patient because then the nurses will tell you quickly this doesn't work or this works great you know so sometimes I'm always the, the advocate of just going for it after a couple of people looked at it but yeah if you have any ideas that's fine too so um, I'm just going to skip ahead I had a vision too that it, it, you know it'd be nice to have different order sets for the patient at risk but not withdrawn and mild to moderate withdrawal, severe withdrawal, I didn't really do that now, but maybe for the future. But you know what I mean, if you have a patient that comes in for an acute um, colon repair and you kind of have a suspicion that they might have an alcohol withdrawal problem, what happens is those alcohol withdrawal orders go on there and they don't really need those. So it seems to me maybe we should have a you know, mild risk, moderate risk, and then our patients are obviously detoxing and, and need the, the true score. The other thing is um, the CWA assessments are done fairly frequently at first and then less so as the CWA scores improve or, and more frequently if your CWA scores are high. So if they're less than 10, the nurse only has to do it every four hours. If they're more than 10 to 14, then every two. And if, 
is higher than that, that everyone, obviously if they're really happy to do everyone, they might need to be in the ICU, because that might mean that they're a really high risk and that they're difficult, and maybe those patients should be in ICU or with a lower, lower census, I mean a lower census nurse. Um, this is the Librium front loading, which is what I put on the protocol, that people can take oral, otherwise it's Ativan. And you can also use the front loading treatment with PRN doses. So what it does is it just gives a dose to the patient. I believe it's every six, I don't have it in front of me. I should have gotten a copy of myself. Do you have any of them? I don't think I made a slide of it because I didn't oh, order. Your fixed dose regimen? Yeah, it's right here. here. Okay, okay, it doesn't tell you on there exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, so the other thing that's really important is there's sometimes when the patient's really agitated and they're not really withdrawing, and those are the patients that you might consider held up for that you might want to call. Like if their CWA score is eight, but they act still like they need that Ativan, maybe you should call the doctor because maybe they're just having something else going on besides withdrawal. And obviously if they're starting to act like they can't protect their airway, or they're, you know, have gotten high doses of benzos, then you, we should probably be moving those patients to ICU. And even a Q1, I can't imagine a floor nurse with five patients going in every one hour. And I mean, maybe you guys do sometimes. Do you guys, I guess you do sometimes. Maybe if it's one time, I could see it, but if you had to do it for four hours in a row, it'd just be impossible. So obviously, when you have withdrawal, you can miss the diagnosis, you can undertreat, you can over treat, you can sedate people so much that they need to be intubated. Um, and you can miss other diagnoses. Maybe I did talk about it here. Um, this is where I talk about, I did a separate order set for um, patients that are high risk for seizures. So what I had read about in the study from 2007 is it was saying that it's really helpful if you think this patient has had a, a seizure with their withdrawal before or they've had DTs before, that you automatically put them on a medication to prevent it. Um, the orders that I looked at had two different med choices, but I think I just chose one. I, think I chose the Tegretol, didn't I? Because it was just easier to dose. I don't have it in front of me, but I, I just chose the Tegretol. I think it was Tegretol and Depakote are the ones you can use. And the Depakote, I think, has to be weight-based, and so it was a little more complex. So I chose the easier one. <laughs> and then we can add the other one in if we, if we need to. I just thought, Make it simple. Um, and mainly because I was typing up the orders myself. <laughs> it's painful to type. I'm not that great of it anymore. How dog can help if you have a patient who's really agitated and difficult to control in addition to the benzodiazepine. It may lower the seizure threshold though with Haldol, so you do have to worry. And Haldol can cause torsades. So if you have a patient with a bad heart or an older patient, you might be concerned. So it looks like for the seizure, Oh, it was a separate order sheet for the seizure order, Susan. But anyway, oh, that one, I just chose one of the medications and I think it was Tegretol. Okay. Because the, you had two choices. You had Tegretol or you had Velcroic acid. It's just too complex. <laughs> so I thought we'd try it. If, it. if we need to switch it, we can. Thiamine is really important for patients with alcoholism and uh, poor nutrition. Uh, because they may have not been eating and you don't want to give them one case encephalopathy. We've had a couple of patients in the hospital recently with one case encephalopathy, and it's a very bad thing. Um, and so you want to give them their thiamine before you give them D5 and even before you feed them. So that's one of the first things they do in the ER is they hang a yellow bag. Have you seen those yellow bags? So that's thiamine and folate. Um, and you can give it IV or PO or IM, right? So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, Definitely give it alcohol levels. Almost, I mean, people that are alcoholics almost always have a low mag. And even if their mag's normal, they're most likely mag deficient because they don't eat well. They're not eating spinach and zucchini and kale and asparagus, I'm sure, for dinner. So <laughs> they're going to be likely magnesium toxic. I shouldn't say that. You might see some in their health nuts and they're still alcoholics. But in general, they don't eat, they eat American food. They don't eat healthily. Um, propofol is another one you can use if you have a refractory patient on the floor. You just can't get that CWAS score below, you know, 10 or 15, and you transfer to the ICU and you can do it. Um, but they'll likely need to be intubated. <laughs> so obviously that's always a thought. So um, I wrote these orders and I would like for you guys all to look at them. And I basically what I, what I wanted to do is obviously if the patient had a low CWAS score, you didn't have to check very often. 
And if they have a high CWAS score or they were really withdrawn, you have to check them more often. So I thought that was a very logical way to do it. And hopefully the way I wrote it out from the other hospital makes sense. They've been doing it like that for a long time. Tells you what to call the doctor about if they're agitated or disoriented, if their CWAS scores stay high. And it also gives some standing orders if the patient is acutely confused or change in sensorium that you can do while you're waiting for the doctor, like check their blood sugar, do pulse ox. I mean, you guys do most of that anyway, but it just writes it down 